Welcome everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger and we are carrying on with our Elementary Mathematics Explained series where we're trying to explain the mathematics for K to 6 students, young primary school students, in a way that's useful to their parents and their teachers and which is sort of oriented from a mathematical perspective rather than the traditional sort of educational point of view. The educational point of view is of course important, but I'm interested in trying to frame what's necessary or what's useful for young people to learn from the point of view of the mathematical landscape. Okay, so today we're going to carry on with this important idea of discussing measurement more generally. Closely connected with arithmetic, we have the dual aims of learning how to count and learning how to measure. And although these are oriented in the same directions, there are subtle and important differences between these two usages of numbers that we're going to slowly um, make contact with here. Today we're going to be talking about measuring weight, which is something that's a little bit fun, that students can directly appreciate, and they can perform experiments, and there's interesting activities. And actually, I'm aiming now to make a small little course on this uh, topic and I'm going to be including interesting activities that you can get your young children to uh, engage in. Okay, so measurement, especially of weights for example, uh, goes back to antiquity where we have a whole variety of measurement systems uh, throughout the ancient world. In the West, the Ancient civilizations, which were most advanced, were the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians. So in ancient Mesopotamia, that's the area around Iraq, uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, uh, we had the Sumerians, remarkable people, really um, forerunners of a lot of modern aspects of civilization, around 3000 BC, roughly contemporary with the early Egyptians. And then followed by the Akkadians, and then the Babylonians around uh, 1900 BCE. Now, even at this time, they had these various city-states, and there was quite elaborate agriculture and a sophisticated kind of uh, you know, city administrations. So there was quite a lot of need for, for measurements, and they had uh, quite an evolved and actually quite sophisticated metrology. So metrology refers to a science of, of units for, for measuring. So uh, when we go back to this time, there's quite a lot of variation, but here is at least uh, some example in the Babylonian system. We have a system of weights, which uh, represented by these uh, quantities. So the primary unit was the mana. Okay? A mana was a unit of weight, which is comparable in our system to a half a kilogram or roughly a pound, roughly. Okay, but they had subdivisions of a mana and they had sort of bigger units as well. So altogether, we might start with the smallest unit, which was the she. And 180 shays equaled one gin. A she was sometimes also referred to as a, like a barley corn. It's a very small unit, very light, and 180 of them formed a gin, which is also a relatively small unit because 60 of those, 60 gins, was a mana, okay, and that's like a pound or like a half a kilogram. And for larger weights, 60 mana was one gu. So in the Babylonian system, the number 60 was quite important. That was sort of their basis for their arithmetic. And so a lot of the relations between units are reflective of the importance of 6 and 10 and multiples or factors of those numbers. Now, what would they have been measuring? Well, probably the most important thing was food, okay, typically. And we're measuring food, well, grain at that time, because they had irrigation and they had a very fertile land, so they could grow crops. And then measuring how much crops you have or how many uh, bushels of something you have, that's going to be an important thing. Now, when you're measuring crops or grain 
corn, wheat, etc., you can measure by volume or by weight. And those two measurements are kind of related, okay? But still there will be certain circumstances where you would want to measure the amount of food by, by weighing it. Something else which is very important uh, in terms of measuring weight is precious metals, particularly gold and silver. Right? To appreciate how much gold you have in your hand, what you want to do is you want to weigh it. Same with silver. Same with other uh, metals too. And they did a lot of their building in bricks, so the weight of a brick would have been something that was important to them. They would probably have wanted to manufacture their bricks so that they were roughly of a uniform weight. So these are all some examples of situations where the ancient peoples would want to have been weighing things. And back then, weighing was almost universally done by balancing things. So you had some kind of system, maybe um, you know, two pans connected by a lever, balanced with a rod or a chain or something like this. And you put whatever it is you're weighing on one side of the balance, and on the other side you put some pre-established weights that have already been determined and sort of calibrated. And so you get them to be balanced, and then you read off how much uh, of these calibrated weights you have on this side, that tells you what the weight of the object over here is. Okay? So there's a, a notion of balance uh, in, in here that would have been used. So in ancient times, weights would have been measured with balances, but these days we usually use scales, which are a little bit more sophisticated. So here's an example of a scale something that sits on the ground, then you put something on top of it, and then there's a, a dial or a, a meter that tells you, you can read, what the weight of the object that you've been uh, placing on the scale is. So here's a dog which is standing on the scale, and we see that the scale has moved so that the, the pointer is aligned somewhere in a number between 10 and 20. We can read 10, we can read 20, we can read 30, and we see that the pointer is somewhere between 10 and 20. So that's telling us that the weight of the dog is somewhere between 10 and 20. Now if we look more carefully, we see that there's not a number associated here, but there's a sort of an intermediate counter that would obviously represent sort of 5. So this is 10 and this is 20, that intermediate value would be 15. And this intermediate value between 20 and 30 would be 25. And there might very well be other intermediate values, finer subdivisions. But in any case, that allows us to estimate the weight of this dog as something a little bit more uh, precise than just saying between 10 and 20. Here we would guess that the dog is maybe around 18. That would be a reasonable guess from the rough position of the uh, needle relative to the scale. So we could say that the dog weighs about 18. Yes, but 18 what? There's a, a system of units here which are implied. And if you actually have a scale, you will know what the units of that scale are. But it might be that the scale in one system is different, uses different units, from a scale in a different system. So over the centuries, over the millennia, there have been hundreds of different measurement systems, scales, units, to measure weight throughout different cultures, throughout different periods. These days, however, things have sort of coalesced that we're only really now using around the world two different systems, the metric or the imperial. And these correspond to the same divisions that we were talking about when we were talking about uh, distances or lengths. So in the metric system, the standard unit is the kilogram, denoted, abbreviated by kg. And in the imperial or British system, the standard unit is the pound, abbreviated by lb. Now, there is a, a relationship between these two. The kilogram is actually heavier than the pound, and in fact, it's a little bit more than twice the weight of a pound. So one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. Now, children who are learning mathematics 
don't necessarily know what the decimals are at this stage. We have not talked about decimal arithmetic. That's to come. I'm just telling you now that this is the relationship between kilogram and pounds. But roughly, a kilogram is twice the weight of a pound. Now, there's also subdivisions, of course. These are not the only units in the metrical system. The main unit may be kilogram, but there are finer units and then there are bigger units as well. So at this stage, let me just point out that a kilogram is also a thousand grams. This is consistent with the metrical system, which likes to use powers of 10 for subunits and, and bigger units. Okay. Also corresponds with our understanding that this uh, prefix kilo refers to 1,000. So kilogram means a thousand grams. So that's represented by this relation. In the imperial system, as usual, things are a little bit more ad hoc. It's not so easy to guess what the subunits are. But it turns out that one pound is equal to 16 ounces. Now, one could say, perhaps, or argue that, yes, the metrical system is more logical. It's closely aligned with our powers of 10 uh, arithmetical system, and that's quite true. And for scientific work around the world, this is almost always what's used. But still, we have to give some credit to the advantages of the imperial system. The advantages are that, first of all, the pound is arguably a little bit more of a useful unit for human usage than the kilogram. The kilogram is a little bit on the heavy side. And we can see that actually by going back to the old Babylonians, right? The old Babylonians, their mana was closer to a pound than to a kilogram. That's telling us something. Okay. And also the fact that the pound is divided into 16 smaller units instead of a thousand, there's something a little bit easier to deal with there. All right. So I'm not advocating here that the metrical system is so much superior to the imperial system. Whichever culture you're in, you will be familiar with one of these systems, and you may not be very interested in the other one, that's fine. But I'm going to present examples and information with both systems, and ultimately relating the two systems is also interesting and useful and an important skill. Okay, so those are the main uh, units that we have for measuring weight around these days. And we also have some secondary units, and we'll be talking more about them in some subsequent video. Today, we're going to concentrate on kilograms and pounds. And um, I should say that when we have scales like this, they're not always these days uh, in this fashion. So here's the scale that we have in our house. Okay, you can't see there, but uh, can I get this thing going? I may have to step on it to start it. Okay, so you can see perhaps here, if I squeeze that, so I'm not sure if you can see, but there's a number, it says something like 15.6, okay, that means that's the representing the pressure or the weight that I'm exerting on the scale because I'm pushing on the back as well, all right. So that's in the decimal system and that's in kilograms. Okay, so we have the scale like this or we have perhaps a decimal reading. Uh, in any case, young people are going to have to become familiar with being able to read such scales. That's an important skill. Okay, so at this stage, maybe they don't know about decimals. Oh, let's get it going again. Step on it first. Okay, they may not uh, know about decimals. So now let's say it says 16.5, uh, let's say. Okay, 16.5. They should know that 16.5 is somewhere between 16 and 17. Okay, at this stage, that's all they need to know. So what is a kilogram? And what is a pound? Well, traditionally, in the metric system established in France around 1795, after the French Revolution, the kilogram was defined in terms of the weight of a corresponding volume of water. So, the measurement of weight, in fact, was closely related to the measurement of volume, which we'll have to talk about in a separate video. But I can explain what this means uh, 
here with this box. So here's a box with sides 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters. Okay, so 10 centimeters is a tenth of a meter. So, so if you have a box like, like that and you fill it with water, that's called a liter. And the weight of that is, by definition, one kilogram. Now, I was looking around in our kitchen and I couldn't find a liter uh, bottle. Sometimes we have them, but sometimes we don't. But here is a three liter bottle. Okay, so in Australia, you can get milk. It's in a three liter bottle. So if this thing was full, it was three, it'd be three meters. And so I've uh, filled it roughly one third of the way. I don't know if you can see the line. There's a line, of, that's, that's got water in there. It's up to about there. It's roughly about a third of it. So that will be one liter of water. That's a liter of water. And the weight of this liter of water, if we sort of ignore the weight of the container itself, that would be one kilogram. Okay, so kids can get an idea of a kilogram by filling a container with water. That's a good thing to do, to get a, a physical sense of, you know, what a kilogram is. Get maybe a couple of containers, you know, and fill this with two kilograms and get them to see the difference between one kilogram and two kilograms or three kilograms, or maybe even a half a kilogram, a little bit more sophisticated. Okay, so that is the standard definition of the kilogram historically. Now, that's not too precise, okay, um, because water itself, its, its volume is dependent on the temperature. So if we want something that's really precise, we have to do something better than that. And for many years, the uh, standard was actually in terms of a plutonium cylinder, which was kept in a particular spot in France under lock and key. And actually was only rarely accessed. You had to have three different individuals with keys to open it to get at this important thing. Because this was the standard reference for the metrical weight system around the whole world. Now what happened is that at some point they opened this thing up and did a check and it was a bit of a fiasco because this thing weighed less than it was supposed to. Like, there was some small, but not insignificant discrepancy between what they thought it should weigh and what it actually did weigh. So at this point, people said, okay, maybe we need something a little bit more uh, sort of independent of actual uh, physical object. And in fact, just last year, I think in May 2018, the international system of units was convened and they agreed that they were going to change to a different definition of a kilogram. And since then, the actual definition is in terms of quantum mechanics. So it's actually closely connected to very sophisticated physics, which can, however, be uh, pinned down quite clearly. So it's in terms of something called Planck's constant, which is a, a very small, um, important quantum mechanical uh, measurement and so the kilogram is defined officially uh, in terms of Planck's constant, not in terms of a plutonium cylinder and not in terms of a kilogram of water. But your young students don't need to know that at this stage. What they should know is that a kilogram is the weight of a liter of water. And what about a pound? Well, the pound is these days um, pinned to the kilogram. So it's a certain fraction of the kilogram. In fact, it's more or less that 2.2 pounds equals a kilogram. Okay, so the kilogram is the scientifically established unit and the pound sort of follows that. Measuring weights is a good way for students to learn the relationship between numbers and the real world. So a natural question is, how much do ordinary objects weigh? This is quite interesting. And students can get a sense of, of the relative numerical values of things. So for example, a cat. Okay, a cat weighs roughly 11 pounds or five kilograms. So maybe a typical average cat. So of course there's a range of possibilities there, but this is a rough thing. And we're using the ratio that the number of pounds is roughly twice, or a little bit more than twice, 
uh, the number of kilograms. And these are all just rough uh, kinds of things. Okay, what about a brick? Well, here's a brick. And, okay, there's a brick. And it's about six pounds or three kilograms. How about a one-year-old child? Well, that's about 21 pounds or 10 kilograms. A five-year-old child, maybe 40 pounds or 18 kilograms. A 10-year-old, 70 pounds or 32 kilograms. And what about something heavier, like a standard kind of piano? That might be roughly about 400 pounds or 200 kilograms. Although a big, like a grand piano would be, uh, you know, possibly twice as much as that. Now, most young people are interested in animals and particular big animals are especially interesting. So what are the weights of some big animals? Well, a typical lion is maybe around 550 pounds or 250 kilograms. Tigers are generally bigger. So a tiger is around 700 pounds or 320 kilograms. A brown bear, well, brown bears come in quite a lot of range of sizes, but uh, a typical, say, coastal brown bear, quite big, 1,500 pounds, 1,500 pounds, or around 680 kilograms. So more than twice as heavy as a tiger. While a polar bear, which are the biggest kinds of bears, they can get up to around 2,000 pounds or 900 kilograms. That's still dwarfed by an elephant. An elephant is 11,000 pounds or 5,000 kilograms. And once they're impressed by that, of course, the biggest mammals on the earth are the blue whales. They are much heavier. So a blue whale, 290,000 pounds or 130,000 kilograms. So these should be very interesting numbers, the relationships between them. How many elephants would equal a blue whale? Where do other animals fit in? How much would a hippopotamus be? How much would a wolf be? So it's interesting to get students to estimate or guess at these numbers. Hopefully they should be able to, with a bit of experience, you know, come up with a reasonable ballpark figure, right? If you ask a child, how much does a hippopotamus weigh? You don't want them to say, you know, 20 kilograms, okay? It's, that's far off. So they, you want them to have a sense of the range. It doesn't have to be exact, but, you know, so that they, they're really touching base with the, uh, the numerical range of values. All right, so that naturally leads to an interesting activity to get children to actually weigh everyday objects and to record those measurements. Now, in order to do that, they have to be able to read a scale. And so we have to teach them how to read a scale. That's a little bit subtle sometimes because the markings on a scale are not entirely there all the time. They only may be occasional markings and they have to extrapolate or be able to interpolate between measurements that are actually shown. For example, here, that's part of, say, a scale. We can see 40 is marked, 50 is marked, and here is the pointer pointing to the relevant weight. So they should be able to appreciate that we've got a range of 10 here, between 40 and 50, and in this case we have intermediate markings that indicate the positions of the numbers from 40 to 50, with the 5, in this case, a little bit more prominently marked. So that's 40, that's 45, and that's 50. And in here we see 41, 42, 43, 44, and 46, 47, 48, 49. Now in this case here, the marker is well, somewhere pretty close to 45, but it's between 44 and 45. So it's not exactly 45, okay? It's close to 45. So we could write W is approximately 45. So there is a need here for estimation, to teach children about estimating. Of course, the scale might look uh, something like this might be a little bit different. Maybe in this scale there's uh, 90 and 100 prominently displayed. And intermediate between those, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, representing the even numbers between 90 and 100. So here, for example, the scale is pretty close to 96. So we can say W is approximately 96. 
So there's a wide range of possible ways that a scale can look. And so children should get some experience with different kinds of scales and being able to see what the scale is telling them. So at this stage, I don't want us to fuss around about fractions or decimals. We don't have to complicate the issue. Later on, they'll learn about uh, being more accurate in terms of subdivision between integral values. But for now, if they run across a 17.4 on a say decimal scale, they should know that that's a representation of a number that's close to 17. So the amount to the left of the decimal is the, the approximate number associated with this. But you might also tell them that this is a, a different kind of number. It's a little bit more refined than just having a, a natural number outcome. It represents something that's between 17 and the next one, which is 18. Okay, so 17.4 is something between 17 and 18, but we don't have to uh, explain the decimal system at this point. That's going to be on uh, later in the course. So we want to develop a general familiarity with numbers. We want to strengthen their familiarity with numbers by getting them to associate numbers with, with measurement. And uh, particularly we want to augment their understanding of relative sizes so that they can appreciate which of two numbers is bigger and roughly by how much. And we want to sort of instill almost a physical or tactile representation in their own minds for numbers. Okay, so the, the measurement system of weights gives us a direct linking, a, a possibility for them to physically represent a number uh, in their minds. Now there's a kind of a subtle point here that I want to emphasize. So a note for parents and teachers, this is not something that you need to directly uh, tell students, but I want you to be aware of it. Okay, so when we're using numbers in the world, uh, there's actually different systems available that we're using. And oftentimes we tend to embrace them all and put them all together. But actually that's a little bit confusing sometimes and sort of misrepresents what's going on. So just as there are different measurement systems, like we may be measuring weight or measuring length or measuring temperature, we're measuring different kinds of quantities there. And within any one of those frameworks, there's different unit systems. We may be measuring in the metric system or the imperial system, for example. And even in a given um, system, like the metric system, there might be different units that we're possibly looking at, kilograms or grams or, or metric tons or something else. So we have this sort of dichotomy of frameworks on the measurement side, but there's also a kind of dichotomy on the number side, purely just in terms of numbers. Okay, And I want you to think about this idea that there's actually kind of two broad categories of numbers. There are counting numbers. Numbers whose role is to count something like that. Okay, One, two, three, four. We're counting the number of things. We have a discrete collection of objects and we want to uh, you know, say how many there are. And the numbers here are very concrete and specific. There's zero. It's a kind of counting number. There's, there's zero fingers. And then there's one and two and three and four and so on. Okay, so these are the most familiar numbers. They're the counting numbers. And they're exact. The two is exactly two and three is exactly three. There's something completely unambiguous about them and their usage. However, there's also numbers in the context of measurement. And the process of measurement is in the same direction as counting, but it's importantly different. Because measurement typically involves an approximate aspect. And correspondingly, the way we use numbers in the measurement sense is different. So here's a scale. We're measuring something, perhaps weight. We see five, six, seven, eight. The needle reads at some point which we estimate, well, it's something between six and seven. Okay, so it's not six, it's not seven, it's somewhere in between six and seven. And exactly where in between is a little bit hard to say. We have to look very carefully at this system. And even if we looked carefully, we might only be able to say where it is up to a certain point. So it's somehow intrinsically approximate. Okay, so 
we can think about using the numbers themselves as, as approximate objects in this context. So a measurement number is not really exact. It's generally approximate. When we weigh a cat and we say, oh, it's eight kilograms, this cat weighs eight kilograms, we don't mean that it's exactly eight. We mean that it's roughly eight. Okay, so it's a different usage, and I want you to be aware of that. So we don't have to make this explicit to young people, but it's important for educators to be aware that the, our number system is actually composed of a number of ingredients which are overlapping, somehow similar, but they're actually quite distinct from a logical point of view. Okay, so now let's talk about some activities or exercises that we can get our young people to do. So one of them is to just weigh various items around the house. We've mentioned this already. This is a very important kind of physical thing to do. It's almost like scientific. We're going out and we're measuring stuff. Okay. In some sense, it's like the basic operation of science. Okay. That's how science starts by measuring things and then recording those measurements. So that's a great thing for students to actually do, not just to learn about theoretically, but actually physically go out, make measurements, use scales, and record their results. Here's a little conundrum that's pleasant for students to think about. So maybe your year two student has a pet cat, and we'd like to know how heavy is this cat. Now, if you try to sit the cat on the scale, well, cats being cats, it will wander off. It doesn't stay still long enough for you to be able to measure it. So a natural question to ask your child is, how are we going to go about measuring the weight of this cat? Okay, And that's something that you can explore with them. And, and hopefully, at some point, they will be able to understand that you could do it by, first of all, the child standing on the scale and measuring himself or herself. And then a separate measurement with the child holding the cat. Okay, so we, then we have two measurements. And then you can talk about how to deduce the weight of the cat from these two. And the way I want you to think about that is to not use subtraction, because we haven't really talked about subtraction too much. Um, it's really addition which is the primary uh, object. So the way I want you to phrase this question is, Okay, we know how much the child weighs. How much do we have to add to that in order to get the weight of both of them together? The amount that we have to add is going to be the weight of the cat. Okay, so we, we frame that question as essentially an addition uh, problem with a sort of an unknown addition involved. Another exercise, simply to guess or to estimate the weight of some more things around the house. So after we've weighed a lot of things, then we can play a game of guessing or estimating things that we haven't weighed up till now, and then seeing how close we are. Okay, that's a great, uh, great activity. And then, of course, one can check one's answers and develop some intuition and you know, a, a sense of what it means to estimate things. That's an important skill. And finally, let me suggest some exercises or activities that strengthen the child's understanding of arithmetic by posing questions framed in this world of weighing. Right? That is a way of giving meaning to questions. So instead of just asking a child, what is 7 plus 5? Okay, that's in some ways, a kind of an uninteresting question. It was like 7 plus 5. Why do I care what 7 plus 5 is? But if we have something that weighs 7 pounds and something else which weighs 5 pounds, and we put them together and ask, how much is the total going to weigh? Well, first of all, the child has to appreciate that that's an addition. Okay, Those two numbers are going to add together, not multiply or anything else, to get the total weight. And that gives us a way of giving some interest to what otherwise might be just sort of theoretical questions. So for example, things like, if one brick weighs three kilograms, how much do two bricks weigh? How much do five bricks weigh? You know, so at some point, you're adding one brick plus one brick, that's three plus three. But maybe when we get to five bricks, 
the child realizes, well, that's better posed as a multiplication question. It's five times three. Or maybe we have two different weights. Two sisters weigh 40 pounds and 45 pounds. How much do they weigh together? So then it's a question of whether the child can effectively add these two numbers in the context of weights. Here's another kind of question where we involve some readings on a scale. Okay, so we weighed a cat, and this is the result of the weighing the cat, what we see on the scale. Here's the result of weighing our pet dog. And here is the result of weighing a boy. Okay, so the cat looks like it's sort of between 11 and 12, closer to 11. The dog is somewhere between 20 and 21. And the boy is somewhere between 30 and 31, closer to 31. Okay, now the question might be, what weighs more? The cat and dog together, or the boy? Okay. So we're doing arithmetic here, but you can see it's not an arithmetic with exact numbers exactly, because the weights here are not exact. So the child has to get a sense of, well, this is a little bit bigger than 11, and this is a little bit less than 21, so the sum is going to be, you know, what? Close to what? Approximately. Okay, so there's lots of other uh, kinds of activities here like this uh, in this uh, context. So I think weighing kind of connects science, elementary science, with uh, mathematics, with real life applications. And uh, there's lots of interesting things that can be done here. In our next video, we'll talk about um, weighing smaller things. So there's a lot of things around the house which are actually lighter and they're not so easily weighed on a scale involving kilograms and pounds, we need to go to sort of finer uh, subdivision, talk about grams and ounces. And that's actually also quite important to get a sense of that and how that connects with the, the kilograms and pounds story. Okay, So uh, I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.